Chris, which one do I stand at? <laughs> Good morning, church. That was pretty sorry. Good morning, church. That was much better. Hey, guys, do you have a favorite song? I like young people, so I'm... You got a favorite song? Have you been in church before? Okay. Uh, so give me a song. Okay, I'll just sing one. You are beautiful beyond description, too marvelous for words, too wonderful for comprehension, like nothing ever seen or heard. Who can grasp your infinite? Wisdom, who can gather the depths of your love? You are beautiful beyond description, majesty enthroned above. And I stand, I stand in awe of you. I stand, I stand in awe of you. Holy God, to whom all praise is due, I stand in awe of you. Be seated, please. It is the greatest thing in the world to be a Christian. I have one woman who believes that that is true. Let me try that again. It's the greatest thing in the world to be a Christian. That's much better. Thank you. Um, so here I am in Texas again. I love to be in Texas. There's some differences between Texas and Tennessee, of course. Um, matter of fact, several of our guys kind of rotated over to the Alamo. That might be why we lost. I'm not sure. <laughs> but anyway, a lot of Tennesseans uh, were at the Alamo. Uh, in Tennessee, in Texas, if you have barbecue, it's usually brisket or something. In Tennessee, if you have barbecue, some pig is going to die. Okay, and so that's a, a little different. Uh, but uh, there's a lot of ways in which we are very much alike. I love the church here. This is uh, Odom Lane is a very encouraging place to be. I understand that you have grown from 73 to your present size over how many years? Wow, it's wonderful. That's great. And so it's good to see you. I understand you're making plans to expand as well you should. That's wonderful. Uh, thank you for the elders for the invitation to come, and thank you, Chris, for being my friend. I expect to see Keely in class on Tuesday. I have her, had her in class last semester, and their daughter, Keely, um, I have her, let's see, I have her this semester. Uh, she's a really good person. So I want to meet the other two of the McCurley kids before I get, leave, so whoever you are, I want to see you. And the rest of you, wherever you are from, you are welcome here. If you're visiting with Odom Lane Church, thank you for coming today. Well, so here we are in the, in the midst of this situation where I've got way too much material. I don't know what in the world I did. You know, in these speeches this weekend, I, you know, had 170-something slides, and so far I'm using about two of them. All right, you know, I'm not, not really getting to very much, but if you want to copy you know, I don't mind you doing that. So why in the world are we suffering? All right, I want you to remember these four things. Um, four things to consider. Well, actually two fours. Are you ready? The first four is this. What is the argument for evil and why is it important? Well, it's the number one argument that an evolutionist uh, will use or an atheist will use against us. All right, and what is it? Well, if God's all-powerful and if God is all-knowing and if God is all-good, then why does he allow evil to continue in this world. Now, which one of those do you want to give up? Well, as a Christian and a believer in the Bible, I don't want to give up any of them. All right, so if God is all good and all knowing, uh, and if God is all powerful, then why doesn't he do something about it? So we should try to find some compatibility there. Now, in order to try to find compatibility, we again are going to look at another set of four. Number one, I want to look at God and see what it means that he is omnipotent, omniscient, omnibenevolent, you know that we've not done that sufficiently. This is a full semester course, and we can't do it over a weekend, but it would involve looking at what does it mean that God is all-powerful? What does it mean that God is all-knowing? What does it mean that God is all-good? All right, that's kind of what we've uh, had an outline of up until this point. And then the second one is, well, what about people? I just asked uh, Robert as a, as a judge, you know, I don't, I'm not going to tell you anything specific about anybody, 
But I said, you know, what do you feel about the, the ability of people to change? And therefore, what we're really saying is, some people will. Because a lot of us are in church. We decided that we wanted to change and we did not want to be the way that we were. We decided that the way that we were living is not the way that God wanted us to live. And that's why so many of you are in church today. One thing about people is that they have the ability to change if indeed they see that they must do it or else. And sometimes it's the or else that gets you to where you want to change. Uh, after I lost uh, one kidney last August, <clears throat> my, uh, my kidney doctor said to me, I want you to lose 50 pounds. And so I'm looking for another doctor. And the, <clears throat> and the reason why is uh, there's more than one of you guys here. I know that. You can't fool me. All right, but I don't want to hear you know, necessarily what sometimes I am told, but that does not mean that I couldn't do it if I really was convinced. Like one day last week, I got on the treadmill for 30 minutes, and then I decided to turn it on. Okay, and so... <clears throat> I actually do try to walk some on the treadmill, but um, it's not as, I'm not as good at it as, as, as I should be. So as we talk about these things, number two, people. Can they change, and what is truly the case about people? Are they inherently good? Are they inherently evil? Is it possible for them to change? In other words, free will. Number three, it's about evil. What is really evil? In other words, if there is a tornado, I understand you have some here in Texas, Okay, we certainly have some in Tennessee. All right, if there's a tornado and someone is hurt, is that a bad thing, an inherently bad thing? Because apparently the free will of people cannot decide whether or not a tornado is going to come. And apparently if this is part of the meteorological system, and if God is the one who put the meteorological system in place, then tornadoes are going to be possible, and therefore God is responsible for that evil. It makes it appear. So what is truly evil? And then number four, what is this world all about? Why are we here? Why did God choose to put us in a beautiful place like this, which also has all the challenges that many of us know are, are here? So today, as we have time, we're going to look at, at uh, the third of those, and maybe the fourth one if we have time, because of evil. So what is truly evil? Hold on. Now, there we go. What about evil, and what about the world in which we live? Well, Rosenberg, whenever he de debated uh, us in September, he is a nihilist. And I don't know if you know what that means or not, but that means a person who believes that there is no right and wrong, there is no objective morality. That's one of the things that was odd about him agreeing to debate a theist. Why? Because he doesn't believe in morality. Then if he doesn't believe in morality... Why is he blaming God for something that is immoral? If you don't believe in morality, why are you saying God should not have done it blank? Or God should have done blank? Why would you argue that if you don't believe that there is right or wrong anyway, and yet nonetheless he did? So, um, here's what he said about morality, what's good and bad. Shame and guilt are emotions practically designed to solve nation's problem of getting us to do the right thing. Here in red is what I was going to say to him. I may have used this slide in the debate. Then please define me what the right thing is. If you are an atheist, then, I, all right, let me, see, let me see if I can get this to work. Are you ready? Micah, how tall is this auditorium right here? Right, what's your first name with the beard? Yeah. Okay, yeah. All right, how tall is this auditorium? How many? 30 feet? Okay, uh, let's see. Who else, who else do I know? All right, Benny, how tall is this auditorium? About 30 feet. Chris, how tall is this auditorium? Oh, sounds good to you. That's only because you're trying to suck out. No, I'm just kidding. All right, all right, so 30 feet. How tall is this auditorium? Guys, how tall is this auditorium? Mark, how tall is this auditorium? Now, how could we ever settle this? If some of you think it's 30-something, some of you disagree with everybody else and are noncommittal, and then there are others who say, well, it's about 30 feet. How in the world would we ever settle this? We had to get somebody to measure it, and we have to agree on the standard of measurement that that person uses. 
So if you're into feet, or if you're into European stuff, you might measure it in meters, in which case I'll pray for you. But the real people measure it in feet. So how high is this auditorium? If you want to know, measure it by an accepted standard. So if you're going to tell me that something is the right thing to do or not the right thing to do, and you are an atheist, well, you know what I'm going to ask you at some point. I'm going to ask you, by what standard did you make that judgment? How did you measure? You're an atheist. You don't believe in right and wrong. How did you measure that? Well, he happens to come up with what he called his core morality. It's not really morality because there's no standard because he's a nihilist. But nonetheless, he said, well, you ought to protect your children. You ought to not kick the dog. And you ought to be, you know, this and that and the other and all that kind of stuff. All of this really means nothing because look at the words he used. In this, he used the words gratuitous and nice. We ought to be nice to each other. Please define what nice means. Nice in the south means something different than nice in the north. All right, and so what does nice mean? All right, and then he said we ought to be treated the same. You would be better off if you did this. This is morally preferable, he says. And then he even says there's a right and a wrong and that there are innocent people. If you are an atheist, please define innocent versus guilty because those are moral terms. And yet you are an atheist. So here's the dilemma that he has. Nihilism is not in the same category with theists because they have no norms. And then I said, I know about your core morality stuff, so don't try to fool everyone. I can justify moral norms because I believe in God. I believe in an objective standard of what right and wrong is. It's the one that Paul uses in his sermon in Acts 14 at Lystra. It's the one that Paul uses in his sermon in Acts 17 on Mars Hill. I know that there is an objective right and wrong, but you are an atheist and you can't come up with anything that is objective. I also teach critical thinking and stuff. Students come to that class in hordes and bunches. because uh, No, they don't because they're afraid of logic. All right, but they will, they will come, you know, critical thinking to help to try to learn to think better. All right, so here's the deal with an atheist, like I had at, in, at graduate school, an atheist teaching logic. Logic is supposed to be the study of correct thinking. But I'm an atheist, so I really wouldn't know the difference between correct thinking and incorrect thinking. So why in the world are you teaching a logic class? That's what I was thinking when I took the class. That's not necessarily what I said to him. All right, but nonetheless, I took the class. I had several classes in logic, but if it is the study of correct thinking, there must be a standard by which our thinking can be judged that's outside of ourselves. Like P implies Q, P therefore Q. Or here's one you might recognize. P implies Q, Q implies R, therefore what? All right, say it to me. P implies Q, Q implies R, therefore what? P implies R, and it doesn't matter. Logic does not matter who your mama is or your daddy. It doesn't matter how much money that you have because it is the correct way of thinking. And here's an atheist, and of course he can't do that. And then so he gave me this little dilemma, which is 2,500 years old, and it comes from Socrates. It's called the Euthyphro Dilemma, and it's this. All right, which came first, good or God? And we're supposed to wither into the carpet whenever he says this. Which came first, good or God? Because if good came first, there was a, it existed before God. And if God came first, it existed before good. So I got up and I said to him, listen, you know, my first year philosophy people know the answer to this. And I don't know why you are thinking that this is such a big deal. So let me see if I can help you with this. God is who he is because he is. Therefore, there was not a time that good existed before God, and there never was a time that God existed when he was not good because they come as a package deal. Therefore, when you say God is who he is because he is, you are saying that goodness resides in the eternal God without which there's no beginning and no end. Alpha and Omega and all that other stuff. All right, and so when we talk about that, that's not a real dilemma. All right, so here's what we're saying. If God is perfect and people are free and sin is evil and the world is for the purpose of making relationships, then it is possible for God to exist and suffering to exist in this world without there being contradiction. So it is affirmed that the only... By the way, I ain't dumbing this down. Okay, if you hadn't had this before... 
I might be omitting a few slides, but I am going to treat you like people who can think. And I do not like people who get fed pablum all the time. Chris does not do that here. And I think that we, we underestimate the desire of people to think when they go to church as well as to feel. It's wonderful to feel, but sometimes you actually need to think. So I want to know there, what is the only thing that's evil in and of itself? The word for that is intrinsic. What is the only thing that's evil in and of itself? Well, let's say then a tornado happens, and the tornado has come, and it has completely destroyed my faith. Now, wait a minute. The tornado doesn't necessarily destroy your faith. Why? Because some people, like my mother, have gone through tornadoes, and it didn't wreck their faith. As a matter of fact, it intensified their love for the power, my mother's love for the power of God. So does a tornado automatically give you a negative relationship with God? And the answer is no. Why? Because it might or might not. Well, what about if you went through a, a period of time like in Abilene where it didn't rain as much as you needed? And you say, well, that's inherently evil, of course. It's intrinsically evil. No, it does not automatically destroy your relationship with God because a lot of people even depend on God more whenever they need rain. Or they depend on God more whenever they're in a circumstance like they've been through an earthquake or, or a death in the family or whatever the situation may be. So you see, suffering in and of itself does not have the ability to destroy your relationship with God. Whether height, nor death, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nothing can separate you from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. All right, that's Romans 8, 37 and following. So if these things cannot automatically separate me from God, what is the only thing that can separate me from God 24-7, 365, 10 times out of 10? What is the only thing that can do it? And the answer is that one short three-letter word, sin. Whenever you say to God, no, and God says to you, yes, you have sinned against God, and when you do this, it will automatically change your relationship with God, especially if you persist. Sin is the only thing that will automatically separate you from God. Psalm, uh, Isaiah 55, sorry, Isaiah 59, verses 1 and 2. Behold, the Lord's arm is not short that it cannot save, nor his ear heavy that he cannot hear, but your sins have separated you from God. Therefore, what is truly evil? Well, I might think that somebody who is, if I am a Dallas Cowboy fan and there's somebody else who is an uh, Eagles fan or some, something else in the NFL, I might think, well, they're evil. Or I might think, you know, various things about another ball team or whatever. Maybe whoever your rivals happen to be that you play uh, here in Abilene. I don't really know. But you might say, well, they're evil. Nah. I mean, you know, we like the rivalry and all that kind of stuff. Not really evil. What is evil? The only thing that is evil is not a surgery. It is not cancer. It's not even death. Because your existence here is but a short period of time anyway. Well, what is it that's evil all the time? And the answer is rebellion against God. Whenever you say, God, I'm not going to do that, or you sin against God, and therefore that will affect your relationship. Now let me tell you about this new generation. Okay, I don't understand my daughter sometimes. We got four. Why? Because we don't want five. Okay, so we got four daughters, and they're wonderful, and I love them. I missed the baby shower for one of them yesterday. Man, I sure wish I could have been there for that. No. Okay, all right, but anyway, I missed the baby shower for one of them yesterday. I would have liked to have been there, you know, for my daughter, but I am not into showers. Okay, so let me say then that I love them, and that's wonderful. But when I talk about the things that are truly evil, I'm thinking about sin as opposed to what may have happened to one of your children or to you or to your spouse. Now, this is not easy to swallow. And it seems so obvious that how in the world could we have missed it? 
There is no physical thing. There is no physical state of circumstances. There is no physical state of affairs that's evil in and of itself. But sin certainly is. Sin always is. It's a dilemma for God because it's like your child has run off from you in the mall and you have uh, looked for him and looked for him and looked for him and looked for him. And then finally after, you know, hours of searching for your child, you find them in some random shop. Okay, if you're a parent, you're going to understand what, I've, what I'm saying here. All right, you want to hug them <clears throat> and spank them at the same time. All right, now why? Because I love you, I love you. Don't you ever. All right, you know, that kind of stuff because, you know, you're a child. Or if you don't believe in spanking, then time out or whatever you, you guys do. But remember that you, you guys are different. Why? Well, you eat it Panera Bread. Let me tell you what I feel about Panera Bread. If you eat there, you're going to be hungry in 20 minutes. Okay, so I don't do Panera Bread. I don't do Starbucks. Why? For $8, I can buy a shirt. Okay, why do I want to spend $8 on a grande or a latte or your mama A or whatever it is? You know, one of these things from Starbucks. And I don't do Chipotle either. I want to recognize my food. So what I'm thinking is, of course, the new generation is different because the older generation likes buffets. Why? We got to get our money's worth. I mean, we got to make sure that we get enough food. So what we do then is the way like buffets and the generation that's younger, generally speaking, does not. Okay, let me see if I can tell you how they think differently religiously. We used to think about doing what God says out of duty, honor, and responsibility. That's what our generation was good at, some of you gray hairs in me. We were good at duty, honor, and responsibility. Why did you go to church? That's our duty. What did you, what did you go to church for? It's our responsibility. Did you enjoy church? Not important question. The point was, we went. Why? Because your mother would see that you went. And only one time would you ever say to your mother or daddy, I don't think I want to go to church. All right, because after that, you would know that your continued existence on this earth was dependent upon the fact that you would go to church. Now, you new guys come along. And we're going to call you the millennials, born since 1983. Or we'll call you Generation Z. Born since 1999. And you want relationships. And that's a little fuzzy to the older generation because we didn't go to church because of relationships. But all of a sudden, you do. That's not necessarily a bad thing. To desire a relationship with God. A lot of young couples want that. Because they've been to churches where they didn't think they could easily find that. It does make you a little different, guys. It doesn't mean that you're wrong. So what I'd like to do is have a congregation that is based on sound relationships while also being sound in the Word of God. So concerning evil, it's about sin. Okay, Christ died for intrinsic evil, which was sin. 1 John 2 and verse 2, 1 Timothy 2, 5. Nothing subhuman can be intrinsically evil. That would also be, my wife has a dog. She has hated dogs her whole life. And when she got sick, we got a, a Maltese zoo. That's half Maltese and half mm, zoo. Okay, and so she, you know, we got this little dog. Okay, and this little dog now sleeps with us. That's another thing that I said that we would never do. We would never have a dog that sleeps with us. And so now this dog does, and he's subhuman, but we treat him as though he were human. All right, and so thus, in a real sense, the problem of evil is logically presupposed by the existence of God. Now, let's talk about this world. What about this world? Well, of course, you're going to fall. Uh, you're, you're going to be challenged by this world. Why? This world is a place for faith development. This is your probationary period. Now, we did not develop or get Adam's sin, Romans 5 and verse 12. If it does mean as in Adam saw, uh, all die, so as in Christ all shall be made alive. If that means that we all get Adam's sin, then we all universally without exception should be saved. 
So it must be something wrong with the way that we're looking at Romans 5.12. So is it true that I have the same lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life of Adam? Oh yeah, I got it. Does it mean that I'm subject to the same weaknesses uh, that he and, and Eve had? By the way, it was Eve who was the first to sin, and I don't know why we get stuck with it. All right, but nonetheless, Eve was the first to sin, and apparently Adam's sin was different because maybe he fully chose where Eve was deceived. 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 12. Yet nonetheless, we live in a world that's fallen. Does it necessarily mean that I have to fall? No. But as a matter of fact, I do. It doesn't mean that I have to fall in this pit, but I do. Well then, what's the deal about living in this world? Somebody suggested last night, and it's a good suggestion, that having to go through the obstacles that you go through in order to get to where you are means a lot more than if somebody just hands it to you. I had a 57 Chevrolet when I was a senior in high school, and I fixed it up. When I went to Fred Hardman, however, my dad put a new set of tires on there. Well, my 57 Chevy would squall pretty good. I mean, not that I would know. Okay, but it would squall pretty good and just leave rubber. Um, because I was young and stupid. And then I had to buy my first set of tires. And then all of a sudden I discovered that the car doesn't have to start quite that fast. It is possible now that I've bought my first set of Michelins that now I understand because I had to pay for these myself. And did I learn? Oh, yes. I learned a lot. You learn a lot living in this world. Because when you have to go through the obstacles that you go through, sometimes you have to learn the hard way. Sometimes you think that you're strong, and you will not have to learn the hard way, but let him who thinks he stands, you be careful, lest you fall, because there are a lot of forces of evil that are out there. Ephesians 6 and verse 10, there's a lot of spiritual wickedness in high places, and Satan still walks about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour, and he would love to get you. Why? Because you're sitting in church. He would love to get you. Therefore, this world is for relationship formation. We begin to learn, to learn to love Jesus now. Because if you were to say to a person that doesn't enjoy going to church, um, well, let's see, what are you going to, you want to go to heaven when you die? Yes. What are you going to be doing in heaven? Well, I don't know if this is the only thing we're going to be doing. We're going to be doing a lot of worshiping. And you say, well, I don't think I want to go there. Well, why? Because I don't like it now. If I don't like it now, <clears throat> well, then why in the world would I want to do it then? This is a place for your soul to be developed. That side of you which is the most spiritually difficult, it is counter to so many physical responses that you want to give, like turning the other cheek. Or if a man sues you to go with him one mile, go with him two. That's not the way a natural-minded person thinks. But that's the way the spiritual-minded person is supposed to think. And so we find ourselves in a probationary period. Some have suggested that maybe the angels did not have a probationary period. Or if it was, it was very short. I do not know the full answer to that question. But angels did seem to be superior to human beings in a number of ways, and some of them are reserved in chains of darkness now. 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 2. So if somebody looks at your little child and says, isn't he or she an angel, just to remember that the devil has angels too. Okay, and so, uh, yes, they are all precious in the eyes of God. But what I do want to say to you is very important, and that is this is the place where God wants us to grow. He wants us to get close to Him. He wants us to work in our relationship with Him. And Jesus says, if you love me, and if you want a relationship with me, then you need to keep my commandments. John 14, 15. If you want to be my friend, you got to do what I say. John 15, 14. In John 8, 31, Jesus says, if you want me to abide with you, which is an older word for have a relationship with you, come to your house and eat supper. If you want me to do this, then you'll have to listen to what I say. So it's not different for young people or for older people. It's still the same. 
you got to listen to what Jesus says if you want that relationship. Because we do have a world that is torn by disaster. But in this world, you have a chance to learn. And in this world in which you have a chance to learn, I think that's one reason why we're here. So, what kind of world should we live in if we want to develop our character and our soul? Well, number one, we need to live in a world that would meet your physical needs, food, clothing, shelter, security, etc. It would need to be a world in which at least you are free to make your own religious decisions and moral decisions. Number three, it would need to challenge you socially and morally so that you can become the person that you can be. Number four, it must allow people to learn from their environment. And number five, it must aid relationship formation. Now, the thing is, sometimes we don't live in this world. Last night, some of the guys were reminding me that Stalin killed far more people than Hitler. But in case you should forget, this is the Dachau concentration camp and the thousands of people who were there at the end of the war. These are the barracks that were supposed to hold 20 people per barrack. And at the end of the war, they were holding 200 people, 10 times the size. We visited the crematorium area there. They had so many people dying or being killed that Hitler had to build two more crematoriums in addition to the one that he had built, which is to the left of here. There are the ovens where the bodies were burned. There was a place there called the gas chamber, um, but it is thought that they were told that this was a, a shower to disinfect them when they arrived from the trains. What it appeared to be would be the Jews, 89% Jews, with a scattering of homosexuals and gypsies and Orthodox priests. About 89% Jewish. They were probably told you're going to be disinfected in, in these showers, but it probably means they had been called and they were not strong enough to help Hitler. Therefore, when they were put on the inside, the doors were shut and a gas by the name of Ziklor B was piped into those things that looked like shower heads at the top and they all died. Some of them are seen here at the end of the war because apparently the guys did not have enough time to burn all the dead bodies. Uh, when the Allied forces had won in 1945. We see, of course, in Hitler the epitome of evil, but in comparison to other dictators like Stalin, he probably killed three or four times as many. So when you think about that, you say, yep, yeah, we live in that kind of world, don't we? There's ISIS and, and other things that, that threaten us. Of course we see the evil. They are, of course, things that can help us to learn to grow. But what we should see here is that Hitler actually broke no law. Why? Because he was German law. At that time, there was no international law that condemned what he did. There was no Nazi law that condemned what he did. So in closing, I would like to ask you, what law did he break? There was a judge afterwards who was judging some of the, not, uh, the, the Hitler regime, Nazi regime, and he said they violated a law that transcended the provincial, which meant there is a greater moral law out there. That greater moral law this morning, I want you to know about. It is the greater moral law of God. And Sunday... We all will be judged by that greater moral law. Therefore, Chris is going to offer the invitation in a moment. One of my favorite passages is 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 14 and following, where it explains what we're going through now as opposed to what heaven is going to be like. Yes, many of you are going through terrible things right now. If it were not the fact that there is a home reserved for us in the heavens, 1 Peter chapter 1, then frankly it'd be difficult for God to, to us to justify why God allows this world to go on. 
But this is the place where you learn to grow. And then you graduate by the blood of Jesus through the grace that is in his blood. If you walk in the light as he is in the light, 1 John chapter 1, you graduate to a place where there is no pain and suffering. And if there are any tears that come down your cheeks, he will wipe away those tears. That's the city that has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. And I look forward to that. I don't guess I'm ready to leave on the next bus. But I look forward to that. Because I have family members who are there. And I'm looking forward to seeing them. I know that some of you do as well. Chris. Thank you, Ralph. I hope you'll stick around afterwards. We're going to have a lunch and then come back in here for Ralph to finish.